I want to teach you today how to pray powerful, effective prayers. Perhaps you've grown frustrated in your prayer life and you feel like your prayers are going up, but that no one is there to hear them. I want to teach you how to pray effectively. I'm teaching on keys to answer prayer. And I'm going to teach you how to pray biblically. I'm going to teach you how to pray powerfully so that when you pray, the prayers that you pray have just as much power in them as the Word of God. That is what I'm teaching on this edition of Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in some worship, and then we're going to get right into this lesson. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. God is able, He will never fail. He is almighty God, greater than all we ask, greater than all we see. He has done great things, and God is able. He will never fail. He is a mighty God. Greater than all we ask, greater than all we see. He has done great things. Lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able, in His name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able. In his name we overcome for the Lord our God is able lifted up defeated the grave raised to life our God is able in his name For the Lord, our God is able. For the Lord, our God is able. For the Lord, our God is I want you to know that an impossible situation is the perfect setting for a miracle. If you find yourself up against the wall, like you're facing a situation that there seems to be no way out of, that is the place that God will meet you. The truth is that if where you're living doesn't require faith, then you're not in the will of God. So when you walk in the will of God, you're going to face circumstances and trials and pressures of all sorts. And you may feel exhausted, you may feel tired, you may feel like you've given all that you can to a situation and that nothing seems to change what's going on with that situation. Well, I want to show you how to pray powerful, effective prayers. Prayers that are prayed with such faith and with such power that they will transform the situation around you. You're believing for something that's difficult to acquire by human effort. Good, because then it requires the involvement of God. If what you are praying for can be done in your own effort, then it doesn't require faith. So if you're facing a situation where you're saying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this one. Or Lord, I don't know how the need is going to be met. Or Lord, I don't know how anything is ever going to change for the better. Then you are in a place where prayer can make a difference. An impossible situation is the perfect setting for a miracle. And any moment can be your miracle moment. You don't know what the next 24 hours hold. You don't know that this week that God's not going to come through for you in a miraculous way. You don't know that things aren't going to transform in an instant. You could be hours away from a miracle and not even know it. You could be minutes away from transformation and not even know it. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence 
of things not seen. I want to emphasize faith. And you'll notice that's going to be a constantly running theme all throughout this message. Faith, faith, faith. When Jesus healed the sick, he would tell them, your faith has made you whole. The scripture says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is the substance. It's the actuality. It's the reality. It's the attainment of the things not seen. It's something that's real. In other words, the faith for a thing is just as good as having that thing. The faith for a saved family is just as good as a saved family. The faith for your healing is just as sure as your healing. The faith for your deliverance, for your breakthrough, is just as sure as the deliverance and the breakthrough itself. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the actualization of it. And it is the evidence of things not seen. In other words, your faith is evidence of the existence of God. Your faith is evidence of the miracle working power of God. Your faith in action brings about the actuality of a thing and it produces real results. So I want to show you how to pray prayers that result in answers, that result in things changing, that result in transformation, prayers that result in the miraculous. And this goes beyond miraculous healing. This could be something you're believing for in your family, in your relationships, in your emotions, in your finances, in your ministry. I know there are ministers watching me right now. You're growing frustrated in your ministry and you're saying, Lord, I've done everything I know to do. And it seems like nothing is changing. Nothing is working. Well, this is exactly the place where a miracle is needed. And that's good news because then the Lord can get involved. But first, I want you to notice that when it comes to receiving from the Lord, it's never, I shouldn't say never because sometimes God does in His mercy, respond instantly. But for the most part, there's a process to receiving from the Lord. And many people want to start with receiving. They come to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I prayed this prayer. I'm ready to receive. And they don't realize that they're skipping many things, many principles involved in praying the prayer of faith, in praying to the place where you receive answered prayers. So number one, here's the first key to answered prayer. Number one is yielding to God's will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. If we ask anything, what? According to His will. Now, there are some people who pray prayers that are against the will of God. In fact, I've had conversations with fellow ministers when we talk about the many open doors to ministries, the many opportunities that present themselves to us in our everyday life. But the question is not, what is the good thing? The question is, what is the God thing? The question is not, what is beneficial? The question is, what is divinely appointed? And when you start to look for the divine appointments, as opposed to just opportunities, you begin to pray according to God's will. You cannot force God to do anything, and God is not reluctant to bless you. So it's not as though God is saying, I don't want to bless this person, and so I'm going to make him pray, 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 pray. I'm going to make her pray, pray, pray. No, on the contrary. Prayer and the waiting is the process by which you become someone who can receive everything that God has for you. So when you're praying for something, it's not that the Lord is saying, I'm going to make them wait for the sake of waiting. It's that if you don't go through the process, you can't handle the answered prayer. If you don't go through the process of becoming the person who can receive in faith all that God has for you, then the blessing will crush you instead of promote you. So God allows us to go through the process when we yield to His will. It's about yielding to His will. If we pray according to His will, if we ask according to His will, He hears us. If we don't ask according to His will, He does not hear that prayer. Now, here's the thing. Think about a police officer. Now, you hear a lot of things going on with police officers nowadays, but we need to pray for our police officers. They're, they're, they help to maintain order. I understand there are some bad members of the group. That's true of any group. But when we pray, think about a police officer. A police officer is acting according to his authority when he enforces the law. The moment they step outside of the confines of the law, they are in violation of that which they are supposed to defend. So the law does not back every action of every police officer just because they wear a badge and just because they represent the law. 
Only when an officer is acting according to the law is that officer able to operate in the full authority given to him by the law. And only when you pray prayers according to the will of God, which is known by the word of God, will you begin to see results in your prayer life. If I'm praying something that God does not want to have for me, then, or give me, then I'm not going to see that thing manifest in my life. And that's not God being cruel, that's God being merciful. Thank God He doesn't give us things outside of His will. Now, we, by our own free will, can force certain things to happen, but that doesn't mean that God cannot um, intervene in His mercy and stop those things from coming to pass. So when you're praying, make sure you're yielding to the will of God, that you're praying according to His word, that you're praying according to His purposes and His desires, His likes and His dislikes. For example, there are certain things that God cannot do. God cannot lie because He is truth. God cannot sin because He is holiness. God cannot do the illogical because He is the basis of all logic. God cannot die because He is eternity. The Lord cannot violate His own nature. He just can't do it. In the same sense, and that's not a weakness, that doesn't mean God is not all-powerful. It just means that it's, how, it's what sustains Him as an individual, as a being, is His holiness. Why is He going to violate His holiness? So. God not doing those things or being unable to do those things doesn't mean he's not all powerful because that would not be a power that would be a weakness if God violated his own nature. So in the same sense, God will not violate his will in answering our prayers. Now we by the flesh can force things to happen and those things will do far more damage to us than good. But ultimately we must pray according to the will of God. So number one, you have to ask yourself, am I yielding to God's will? Number two, hearing God's word. The scripture says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now that scripture in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 is in reference to salvation. So the context is salvation. Those who hear about salvation have the faith to receive that salvation. But the principle itself can apply to many things. When you hear a promise of God, when you hear what God is offering, it inspires in you, it stirs in you faith to believe for that thing that God has promised. So you need to hear the word. You need to hear what are the promises of God so that your faith can come alive. Mind your surroundings. Be careful who you allow to surround you. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Be careful who influences you. Be careful what movies you watch, what music you listen to. Not because we're religious and we think that God is going to condemn us for such things, but because of what it does to us as individuals. It's because it, it, what it does is it disrupts the communication between God and us. And so when we start to involve ourselves in things that we hear that are not of faith and are of the flesh and are of the demonic, we begin to chip away at our faith and our faith begins to dwindle and we lose that stirred faith. We lose that power to receive all God wants to give us. If you don't have faith, it might as well be that God never promised you a thing because you won't receive it anyway. We need to hear. We need to hear in faith. Now it's possible to hear with your natural ears, but not with your spirit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, he said, he who has an ear, let him hear. He was talking about a spiritual ear. He was talking about being able to hear in the spirit. He was talking about to be able to, by the Holy Spirit, hear the promises, the voice of God. And so the Holy Spirit needs to breathe life onto the promises of God. And we need to daily fill our minds with the word so that we become people of faith. And when you hear the word of God, you know what his promises are. And then you ask what according to his will, which was the first point, And it's more likely to come to pass in our life so long as we do the other things. Number three is thinking in faith. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The mind is both the root and the battlefield. It is the root of all that you do, and the mind itself being rooted in the spirit or in the flesh. It is the root which results in the fruit of your life. So if the mind is rooted in darkness, your fruits will be of darkness. If the mind is rooted in light, your fruits will be of light. So as you think, so are you, but the mind is also the battlefield. It's the place where we fight the most intense war that we'll ever fight. Probably 
I would say this, the essence of spiritual warfare is the fight to believe God's truth over the enemy's deception. I think that is the summary of spiritual warfare. That is the shorthand definition of spiritual warfare. It is the fight to believe God's truth over the enemy's deception. Why? Because all the enemy's attacks are going to be grounded in deception, at least against the believer. And so we need to be people who think in faith. We need to be constantly thinking in faith. We need to yield to God's will, hear God's word, and think in faith. And when we're thinking in faith, as we're praying, we're not double-minded, which is important because number four is key, which is believing in faith. In James chapter number one, verses five through seven, the scripture says this, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty or a double mind is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Did you hear what that scripture said? It's a powerful truth found in James. You won't receive anything if you're double-minded, if you've wavered back and forth. Faith does not waver. Faith is certain. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, when we believe in faith, we start to see according to how God wants us to see. I, just, I thought of this scripture too, while putting this together. And this is one of my favorite portions of scripture in the book of Psalms. And it's found in Psalm chapter 77. And I'll read beginning at verse 16. This is what the Bible says here. When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. No one knew that pathway was there, that is, except God. In other words, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. You're facing a situation, you're in trouble. It could be financial, it could be in your family could be in your ministry, could be a spiritual crisis that you're facing, could be something you're facing with a sinful habit that you want to stop and you're looking at the situation and everything in you is saying, there's no way, there's no way I can overcome this. There's no way I can get out of this. There's no way this can change. Nothing will ever be better. But remember, you serve a God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. He's going to get you out of it. He's going to get you through it. No matter what you're facing, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. You just have to believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Don't doubt. Don't waver. You need to be fixed on the promises of God and say to yourself, I will believe the Lord. I'm not going to believe my circumstances. I'm not going to believe what my mind tells me. I'm not going to believe what the enemy tells me. I believe the promises of God. And his promises, the scripture says, are yes and amen. They are certain. I have confidence in the certainty of the promises of God. It will come to pass, no exceptions. You are not an exception to the promises of God. You are not an exception to the power of God. If God will do it for someone else, God will do it for you. He will come through. I promise you that. Listen to me. I promise you that. He's able. He has never let anyone down. God will bring his will to pass in your life. So don't waver. Believe in faith. Be certain. Be stubborn. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Believe the promises of God. So number one, yielding to God's will. Number two, hearing God's word. Number three, thinking in faith. Number four, believing in faith. Number five, declaring the word. Romans chapter 4, verse 17 says, 
As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. In other words, God is able to call things into existence. God is able to call things that are not as though they are. Think about this. God simply spoke and caused all of reality, time, matter, and space to simultaneously come into existence. That's power. That's power behind His declaration. God has the creative power to declare things and to cause things and to move things just by the sound of His voice. I want you to think of that power. Think about what that really implies, that God... His word alone is enough to create a world. That's powerful. You don't think that God who created this world is able to move things and influence things in your favor? Of course He is. But the question is not getting God to act according to my will. It's getting you to act according to God's will. God is not our servant. God is not someone who's there to re meet our every whim if we apply the right mechanics. I'm not teaching you faith so that you can get God to move for you. I'm teaching you faith so that you'll get moving for God. So that you can say, okay, Lord, I'm going to align myself with your will. And in doing so, it brings down the blessing of God because whatever is in his will is blessed and at perfect peace. So prayer, more than it will change anyone else, will change the one who is praying. Prayer, more than it will change anything else, will change the one who is praying. So we declare by the word, though. We still can declare because we're like our God. We are like our God. In Genesis chapter 2, the scripture says that God breathed life into the dust and man became a living soul. That was his ruach, his spirit, his breath, his life moving into the dust. And when it entered the dust, life came about. In other words, I came from my father. When he, God created the birds, he said, let the, let, when he, he, he spoke and things came into existence. I mean, just think about that power. I'm, I'm just... I, I know I'm fixated on it, but I think you will come to appreciate it the more you think about it. When God wanted to bring forth fish and creatures of the sea, He said, let the waters bring forth. He spoke to the sea. When God wanted to bring forth animals and creatures on the ground, He said, let the earth bring forth. Or He brought, brought forth vegetation that way. But when God created you, He spoke to Himself. Let us make man in our image. We proceeded from God, therefore we are like Him. We are created in His image. We're created in His likeness. Now, religious people can't stand this teaching because religion, the entire philosophy, is based upon getting you to hate yourself to such a degree that you accept punishment. Let me tell you something. You are like your Creator, and I don't care who that upsets. God created you that way. He did not create you to be in sin. Sure, God punishes sin. Sure, man is sinful. I acknowledge all of that. It would be unbiblical to deny that. But at the same time, recognize who you're from. Recognize who you belong to. You're royal. You have, you have an air of elegance about you. Think about the blood of the king courses through your body. That's, that's a powerful thing to consider. And so in considering that, we realize that we, like our God, have power in our words. Now, I'm not saying that you can speak and create anything you want, because then that would, be, that would be too much power if God gave that to man. So God did not give man that sort of creative power. But even though God did not give man the power to create through his words, he did give man the power to influence through his words. In other words, what God created can be influenced and cultivated by man through action, through thought, and through word. So therefore, your words are both indicators and to some degree creators. I don't mean they create in that they bring from nothing. I mean that they create in that they shape what is already formed, what is already created. So God has given us the raw materials of creation with which we are to form and to create and move according to His will. And so your words are indicators and creators. They create around you and they indicate the condition of your heart. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. There is power in your words. Number five, obeying God's commands. Now this is going to be a big one, so I want to stop here for a little bit. So just to, just to recap to where we are. Keys to answered prayer. Number one, yielding to God's will. Number two, hearing God's word. 
Number three, thinking in faith. Number four, believing in faith. Number five, declaring the word. Number six, obeying God's commands. Now look at this verse. Now when we look at this verse, I want you to really look at this with me, okay? John chapter 15, verse 7. Look at what it says. Here's a condition. Okay, let's, let's not read it yet. I want you to really, I'm going to tell you what to look for. Here's a condition that Jesus is giving to us. Now he says, if you do this, I'll do anything you ask me for. That's a powerful statement. And this is coming from the highest authority. This is Jesus himself promising us something. So what is he promising us? John 15, 7. Look at what it says. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Think about what he's saying. You can ask me for anything you want. You can ask me for anything. That's Jesus making you this promise. You can ask me for anything you want. And it will. It, not it may be granted. Not it might be granted. Not it will be granted at some point. In the, he says it will be granted if what? You remain in me and my words remain in you. Now... Because this is such a powerful result, I want to know how to meet that condition. I want to know how to remain in Him. Well, this is what the Scripture says. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. It tells you what it means to remain in Him. 1 John 3, 24. Look what it says. Whoever keeps His commandments remains in God, and God in Him. By this we know that He remains in us, by the Spirit He has given us. Now, it's a little more direct even here. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Look at what it says. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. We receive whatever we ask. Why? Because we keep His commandments. That's the cause. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So because we obey, He answers. If you're not obeying God, your prayers will not be answered. They'll be hindered. Look at what Psalm chapter 66 says. Psalm chapter 66, verse 17. This is a very pointed way that the psalmist phrases it. Psalm 66, verses 17 through 19, the scripture says, For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. Now here's where it's, it's very pointed. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Listen to that again. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen he paid attention to my prayer. You know, the scripture says that God resists the proud. That's James 4, 6. He will not hear the proud. Now, of course, if a sinner repents, God hears that prayer. Why? Because that prayer is according to his will. And the person has changed the posture of their heart from resisting God to humbly surrendering to God. So James 4, 6 tells, tells us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You cannot come to God in pride and be saved. So those who come to Him to be saved are humbling themselves before Him, and in doing so, they're positioning themselves to be able to receive from Him. So God resists the proud. God does not answer selfish prayers. That's James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. If the prayers are prayed so that we can consume them upon our own lust, or we pray from selfish motives, God's not going to answer those prayers. We just read that God will not answer prayers if you have unconfessed sin. And I'm not talking about trying to remember every little sin you've ever done in your life. And if you leave one thing out or forget one thing that God won't hear you. No, I'm talking about the position of the heart. David knew that if he did not get his heart right before God, that the Lord would not have heard him. I don't think it's really even possible to remember everything and confess everything in that manner. And so God resists the proud. God resists selfishness. God resists those with unconfessed sins. And here's one for the spouses. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 tells us that if there's discourse between you and your spouse, that God will not even hear your prayer then. And all the married people said, Amen. Have you ever tried to pray when you, just after you got in an argument with your spouse? It's not going to happen. 
You know, my wife, when, whenever the Lord speaks to my wife or myself about each other, we go and take care of it. In fact, my wife doesn't have to nag me because I pray. So I'll go and I'll pray and the Lord will tell me, your wife was bothered by this, this, this thing that you did today. And I'll think, really? I didn't even realize that bothered her. And I'll go and I'll say, Jess, did this bother you? She'll say yes. And I ask the Lord to tell you. So in that way, there's communication. There's divine communication. And it doesn't always work that way. Trust me. There's work you have to do to it too. But if there's, if there's discourse between you and your wife or you and your husband, God's not going to hear your prayer. The scripture says it very clearly. So number one, keys to answered prayer, yielding to God's will. Number two, hearing God's word. Number three, thinking in faith. Number four, believing in faith. Number five, declaring the word. Number six, obeying God's commands. And number seven, asking in faith. Now, I know we talked about having faith, but this is where you ask. You have to open your mouth and say, Lord, I'm asking now. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. We'll read it here. We read a portion of this, but I want to read it to you again. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he, that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. John 14, 14 says, Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Why does God give us the desires of our heart when we delight ourselves in Him? It's because we become people who can receive in faith that for which we pray. Prayer and waiting processes you into becoming someone who can receive the weightier blessings from God. And then you receive in faith. And that's number eight. That that's less on you and it's more on God. Well, that is it for the lesson. I hope that blessed you. I want to pray with you now. Let's go before the Lord. Oh, before we, we finish, I'll recap one more time. Yielding to God's will, hearing God's word, thinking in faith, believing in faith, declaring the word, obeying God's commands, and asking in faith, and then you receive. So you don't start with receiving. That's the finished product. That process is the process of praying powerful prayers, effective prayers that change circumstances and situations all around you. So let's pray now and I want to ask the Lord to stir your faith because as I said a constantly running theme through this lesson will be faith. And so when you have the faith to receive you've become one who can receive the blessings of God. God will not give to you above your measure of faith. He will not trust you above what you've been tested to receive. So let's pray that God would expand your faith, grow your faith, and stir you to boldness in action, that you might be one who prays powerful prayers, that you might be one who can pray and move mountains, who can pray and see the sick healed, who can pray and watch the circumstances all around you begin to transform. I believe, that, look it, I believe that's you. I believe God wants to change things for you. But first, He wants to change you. He wants to change your heart. He wants to transform your nature and make you more like Him. So let's pray. Come on. In faith, I want you to stretch your hands toward mine. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one receiving this prayer right now. And I ask Jesus that you would stir that faith. Lord, I pray that there would be such faith that they would ask prayers that surprise even themselves. Father, I pray that as they pray, they would remember all that your word has said about prayer and that they would in faith ask boldly and receive in gratefulness. I thank you, Father, for the power of God that's now flowing. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. There's a couple watching me. You're watching together. And you've been believing God. You've been trying now. It's been about two and a half years been trying to have a child. The Lord is going to bless you in believing for that miracle that's happening for you. I believe it in faith. Declare it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stir your faith. I want you to ask the Lord. I want you to thank Him. And I want you to name that child. You want a boy or a girl? I want you to name the child. Say, Lord, thank you for so-and-so coming into the world. And I want you to receive it in faith. 
Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, all the miracles that you're doing. There's a healing anointing flowing too. Thank you, Jesus. Look, there's someone, uh, you injured your neck and the doctors are saying there's gonna be some long-term damage. But we're rebuking that right now in Jesus' name. And I, in fact, you feel like a heat coming over you. Go back to your doctor, have him check you. I believe the Lord's healing you. Father, I thank you. I rebuke cancer, Lord. I rebuke arthritis in Jesus' name. I rebuke skin disorders. Skin disorders are being healed. Someone with a skin disorder all up on their left, their left side, you're being completely made whole. If you look, you'll see God's healing you right now in Jesus' name. So Lord, I thank you for stirring our faith to pray bold prayers. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to say it. If you agree, say, Amen. Well, that, as I said, is it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you and we're praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. Remember, if you would like to join the Spirit family, then go ahead and use the information at the bottom of your screen to sign up. It's free. You get a weekly email that comes with the lesson and you can respond for prayer support. Over 2,000 members from all around the world have joined Spirit Church. So join the Spirit family today. I want to read your comments now, and this is from last week's video, the video entitled, Can You Hear the Cry? And this lesson was a challenge to begin evangelizing your world. The first commenter writes, very important message. Please, Lord, let us hear them and lead them to you. Amen. Elaine writes, thank you, Brother David, for this powerful message. May God bless you. Marlon writes, well, thank you, David. This blessed me so much. Annie Louise writes, awesome and heart-touching word, divine worship as well. May God bless you guys abundantly. Sana writes, thank you, Father. Thank you, Pastor. I needed this reminder. And when you were praying, I felt some sensation on my fingers when I stretched my hands toward you. God bless you. Well, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we received many reports of people sensing the power of God just while watching this on the Internet. And the final commenter, Menla Senti, writes, Praise God. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Thank you, Brother David, for your marvelous message. I pray that God will use me in a mighty way to win more souls for His kingdom. May God bless you more and more. Amen. Well, there's a way you can get involved in soul winning, and we can do it together. So I have been updating you on a campaign that we've launched. Many of you know we've been trying to raise support through monthly partners. Now, look at where we are in the process. Here's this graphic up on the screen for you. We needed 1,000 new $30 a month partners to sign up, and we are less than 200 away now. And I believe we can wrap this up in the next couple of months. So we need just under $230 a month supporters. That's 200 people giving $30 a month. So that's where we are. Now, what is this going toward? Well, first of all, we want to tell you why we're doing this. We want to win souls. And I believe we are on the cusp of one of the greatest moves of God that this nation, this world has ever seen. And I believe that this ministry is right on the verge of another growth spurt. You've watched over the years and you've seen certain seasons where God has just rapidly expanded us. And that's actually happened three or four times. And I feel another one coming on and this one is going to be the biggest one. Listen, you're going to be able to say, I'm a part of something. I'm winning souls. I'm reaching people for the kingdom of God. And I was there at the very beginning when they were just starting this out. So here's what we're doing. We are looking for a brand new place to call home for our new ministry facility. Now here we're running out of space. We're running, we don't have any more office space. The studio space doesn't, isn't really ideal for accommodating a studio audience. And so we want to have a place that we can call home, a new place to call home, that we can produce more programs from, we can have weekly meetings from, we can broadcast live, we'll have a 24-7 prayer room, Ultimately, it's a TV studio that we're building and you can come in and attend the services and it will be powerful and we'll broadcast live all over. But ultimately, this next phase of ministry is going to help us to win more souls than ever before. Because not only with that finance, that monthly support, are we going to be able to get into this new facility, but we're also going to be able to do more events more often and in more places. So if you've been praying for God to bring us to your region, this is how you get us to do it. You have to help so so that we have the resources to go. So we need $30 a month supporters. We need you to sign up. And when you do, I'll send you either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths about Demons and Spiritual Warfare. I will sign it as our initiation gift to you to say thank you for partnering with us. So do that today. Don't wait on that. If you're watching this on YouTube, then you'll see at the very end of this video, you're going to see a screen pop up with some links that you can actually click. 
So wait until the end of this video, click that link. If you're watching this on the app, you'll see a place to donate right when you exit this video. It'll say partner with David or donate. Do that today, don't delay, don't wait. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, become a supporter, help us, lend us a helping hand in winning souls. If everybody who watches this video signs up today, we'll go well over the 200 mark. So I'm trusting that God will speak to your heart and I'm trusting that you'll obey Him. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.